calling us, Lord, calling us together, calling us as part of your people, Lord, part of an end time movement that will reveal who you really are to the world, Lord. And this morning as we come into your presence, Father, we ask that you will make your throne here in this sanctuary this morning, Lord, that each and every heart will be touched with your spirit. Lord, we ask for you to pour out your spirit on us that you may instruct us from your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us in singing hymn number 223. our prayers and petitions before the Lord. Um, please remember the pastor in your prayers. He's been sick all week, and they were supposed to leave for vacation yesterday, so praying that the whole family doesn't get it while they're on vacation. Um, are there any other prayer requests? Kathy. Serena? <laughs> I think all the kids will agree with you on that one. <laughs> Janet? God. Awesome. 
<laughs> Definitely. Kathy? <laughs> Praise God. Serena? another hand. Unspoken. Any others? Hmm. Oh, yeah. Definitely keep you in prayer. Phyllis? Praise God. Serena? Okay. All right. How about unspoken? All right. Shall we kneel for prayer? Gracious Father, Lord, we praise you and thank you for all that you've done for us. We all have praises that we can direct to, to you that, where you've blessed our lives in so many ways. We just thank you. Lord, you've heard the prayer requests. You know each situation. I'm not going to list them separately, but Lord, you know what they are. And we just pray for your will in each situation, whether it be sickness, um, tests that are coming up, um, exams, medical exams. Lord, I pray for each situation that your will be done and that each situation will bring you honor and glory. We thank you for the praises that we've heard, many praises this morning, and we thank you and praise you for those, and we know that you're always looking out for us you have our best interest at heart. We don't always have our best interest at heart, but you do. And we just praise you and thank you for that. Please be with Zach today as he brings your message. We pray that it is a message directly from you and that he is just a vessel to deliver it to us today. Please speak through him. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and minds that we will be receptive to your word. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and the chance to come and praise and worship you. We thank you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. At this time, we will receive our tithes and offerings. Today's loose offerings go for the multilingual ministries and the chaplaincy ministries. The deacons would come forward.
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for your many blessings, your blessings that you've given this church and each individual here. Lord, please use these funds to further your work around our community and the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. Is anyone scheduled for the children's story today? Okay. If the children will come forward, Kathy McFadden will have our story. again. Hi, little people. How are you? Good, 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 good. Do you know what the big people were studying about this week in Sabbath school? You do know? Take a guess. What is it? You'd have been safe if you'd have said Jesus, because we always do. <laughs> but we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. All right? Is Jesus coming back? How many of you in the front row here believe that Jesus is coming back? Okay, now turn around and look behind you. How many of you in the back rows believe Jesus is coming back? I do too. I do too. Are we going to be ready when Jesus comes? Oh, let's try that again. Do we want to be ready when Jesus comes? Amen to that. Okay. And you know there's only one way to be ready when Jesus comes to take us home. Do you know what that is? Believe and follow. Trust him. Stay this close to Jesus, okay? This close to Jesus. Be ready no matter when it happens, okay? I'm going to tell you a little story that kind of, it's a true story, and one of my sons is going to be very embarrassed, and it's not him. It's going to, <laughs> it's going to be the one watching on TV today on our satellite ministry, our, our website, and, son, I'm so sorry, but this one is for you. This is about my... I got it before. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so this is about my oldest son, Andrew. I call him Drew. And uh, he, you, some of you met him when he was here. Well, this one's for him. He was young, uh, younger, and he went on a big school class trip. Yes. A big class trip, and they went to all kinds of historical sites, and, and they were having a wonderful time, except for the teacher that was in charge of the whole group, because one child was making his life miserable. Do you know whose child that was? Yeah, it was my child, Andrew. Yeah. Now, he wasn't a bad kid. He was not a bad kid. And he wasn't terribly out there doing anything wrong. He just couldn't wake up. When he was tired and he laid down and he went to sleep, forget it. It's not going to happen. You're not going to wake him up. So every time they got to one of their stops and the bus stopped, the teacher had to go looking. Okay, where is he sleeping now? Where is he sleeping now? Come on, it's time to go. And he got so tired of that that he finally said, Andrew, I'm going to tell you right now, either you're ready when we get to the next stop, or you're going to miss out. And Andrew was so sorry and so repentant, weren't you, son? Uh, <laughs> that he said, I'll be ready. I'll be ready. I will be ready. But the trip to the next stop was so long. And they had done so much. And he was so tired that he took his backpack and he went to the very back of the bus where nobody was looking because he promised he would stay awake. He promised he would be ready, but he was just too tired. He laid that backpack down and just for a minute now, mind you, laid his head down and closed his eyes. Did he stay ready? Did he stay awake? No. Now, I want you to know where the next stop was because this is what made it super interesting. They were going to stop and see Notre Dame Cathedral. The, the Notre Dame Cathedral. They were going to go in and they were going to see Mass was in service and it was a very solemn thing. 
So they had all been given their instructions on how they were going to enter quietly and be very reverent in that huge cathedral, not be disruptive, and everybody knew exactly what they were supposed to do. So they pulled up at Notre Dame. Everybody offloaded. Everybody was very quiet, very peaceful, and very reverent. And they were just going to be very quiet. They went into Notre Dame Cathedral. And they sat down to watch the service and to experience this huge, beautiful cathedral. Except for one. Except for Drew. Where do you think Drew was? On the bus sleeping. sleeping. Oh, and she wasn't even there. Yes. <laughs> On the back seat of the bus with his head down, snoring. Okay? They didn't know he wasn't there. There was enough kids there, and off they all went. He woke up, and he realized he was the only one on the bus. He was the only one that wasn't ready. And guess what he did? He said, oh, no, 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 no. No, not this time. He grabbed his backpack and all of his clunky things, and he jumps off the bus, and he runs into Notre Dame Cathedral, and he yells at the top of his voice, I'm here! Oh, what a day it will be. (laughs) Let's just say the wrath of teacher fell on him that day. It wasn't fun. Uh, He did learn quite a lesson. But, you know, the good part was he had a whole lifetime to learn from that lesson. Now, when Jesus comes and that day is here and he says, come home, my children, we must be ready. Because we won't have a second chance. No matter what anybody else tells you, there is no second chance. Okay? You have to be ready. Do you want to be ready? I do. Do you? How about you, Ethan? You want to be ready when Jesus comes? How about you, sweetheart? Yes. Okay. We all want to be ready when Jesus comes. Let's stay ready always, every day. Talk to him. Tell him what's in your heart. Stay close to him. Read his word and share it with others, okay? That's how we stay ready. Are you ready to pray with me right now? Can we close our eyes and bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you for sending Jesus to this earth one time already to teach us, to guide us, so that we can prepare to meet him this second time when he comes again in the clouds of glory. Father, that time is soon, we know, because of the signs of the times. We want to be ready. We want our friends and our families to be ready. We want everyone to stand and say, Lo, this is our God. We've waited for you. You came, and we are ready. May that day be soon, dear Father, we pray. In the name of your Son, who loves us so. Amen. The children are going to pick up their lambs offering now, if you will. This is their ministry to help the church. A very, very special music today. You know this young lady very well. Her name's Lily Nunley, and she didn't even know she was having special music today.
So she said, do you mind if I bring a few friends with me to do special music? And I said, that would be great. So that was me. And then I said, can I bring a few friends? And she said, that would be even better. And you know what? That's you. <laughs> if you'll turn in your hymnals to hymn number 88, we want to sing about the mighty power of God. from Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 12 Revelation 14 9 through 12 then a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Brother Zach. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Let me move this mic out of the way because I've been told that I have a very loud mouth, so I'm sure this body is happy for you to hear me. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, scripture reading, not one that uh, really keeps you. Uh, War gives you any warm fuzzies that some of the other Bible uh, texts do, but a very important one, a very important warning from a loving parent who wants to keep us from making the worst mistake that we could ever make. Um, our topic today is marked for eternity. Today we're going to talk about very serious issues that will shortly impact you and I. Let us pray. Lord, we know that warnings in the Bible are not meant to scare us, but they're given from a loving God, a God that sees the end from the beginning. And Lord, today as we present the third angel's message, Father, first of all, I ask that you pour out your spirit in a mighty way. Pour out your spirit, because without your spirit, Father, we can't even begin to understand the Bible. And Lord, I pray now for a portion of that spirit, Lord, that you will speak and not me is my prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Let us, Jeff read it very well, let us go over a little bit of that message again. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. What is the wine of the wrath of God? Simply the seven last plagues. And then the rest of that goes on to say, you'll be tormented with fire and brimstone. Uh, Not something you, you want to have happen to you. So the third angel's message brings to mind two questions. What is the beast? And what is his mark? After all, if I'm going to try to avoid receiving something, shouldn't I know what the beast and his mark is? Four weeks ago, we studied about the beast power. Let's review this for just a moment. The Bible says in Revelation 13, 1 and 2, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, notice who gives him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Who is the dragon? Satan, absolutely. So who is behind this power? Satan. We, know, we studied four weeks ago that this power had seven identifying characteristics. First, it would receive the seat of its government from pagan Rome. In fact, the Bible identifies that it's actually a continuation of the pagan Roman Empire. It would be a worldwide system of worship. It would speak blasphemy. That is, it would claim to be God or claim to be able to forgive men's sins. It would be a persecuting power. We studied how 50 to 150 million people were put to death by this power. It would reign for 1,260 years. A lot of people think the Antichrist is a person. Well, what person could reign for 1,260 years? My friends, we're talking about spiritual powers at the end of time. Spiritual powers that will engage in battle over you and me. Powers that the devil uses in his kingdom. 1260 years. Does anyone remember what those, when the beginning and end of those years were? I want to encourage you, uh, when I ask a question, please participate. That way I know you're awake and I'm still awake, Okay. 538 to 1798, exactly. And we studied how its deadly wound would be healed. And we studied how in 1929, the uh, Italian government under Benito Mussolini um, had a... um, had a meeting with a cardinal named Cardinal Gaspari, who later became a, uh, a pope, and this deadly wound was healed. And the number, notice this, the number of this beast would be 666. Do you remember the identity of the first beast? The Antichrist, the Bible identifies it as the papacy. And the Bible has identified this for the last 2,000 years. So now we know the beast, what's its mark? And I want to encourage you, uh, study for yourselves. We've gone through this topic very quickly. Four weeks ago, we studied it in detail. Be a Berean Christian, my friends. Study the word of God for yourselves. Because now, the days in which we live, these are the times when we need to know our God with an intimate relationship, my friends. Just like Daniel and his three friends. We need to know God that same way. Amen? I want to make a distinction this morning between the number of the beast and the mark of the beast. You see, a lot of people think the mark of the beast is 666. Like that first slide that I showed, that's not what the mark of the beast is. The mark of the beast is not 666. The number of the beast is 666. It's an identifying characteristic of this system. The Bible says it's the number of a man. A man speaks for the system. 
Do you remember Roman numerals? If you take this papal title up on the screen, Vicarious Filii Dei, which was incidentally written on the mitres of many of the popes, what it means is vicar of the Son of God or one who takes the place of the Son of God on earth. Antichrist, one who takes the place of the Son of God. If you add these up, do you remember that V is five, I is one, what's C? A hundred. How about A and R? Do they have any value? No. Um, U. A lot of people have pointed out, well, there was no U in ancient times. That's true. That's a relatively new thing in Roman numerals. In the 19th century, they added a U. It was interchangeable. Have you ever seen on the courthouses where there's a V in place of the U? That's why that, that, that's used like that. And... Um, it adds up to 666. Man was made on the sixth day, and God says, here, this system is all about man. 666. It's an identifying number. My friends, at the end of time, the issue revolves around worship. Does that surprise you? It's always been about worship. In the very beginning, what did the devil want? He wanted worship. In the Garden of Eden, down through time, there's always been two groups. One who followed Jesus and one who follows man. Ultimately, Satan. And at the end of time, Satan's representative, the beast. One group worships the beast. One group worships the creator. One group receives the seal of God, sealed for eternity. The other group is marked for eternity with the mark of the beast. So what is it about this sealing and marking business? 2 Timothy 2.19 says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having what? Having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. The Bible says the reason for the seal is that God identifies who are his. The seal of God. It's not going to be a mark or seal on someone's head that you'll see. It's a seal in the character, a seal in the life. God identifies those who are his. So who is it that seals the people of God? You see, this morning, let's talk about the seal of God first. I know I promise we'll talk about the mark of the beast. You see, the seal of God is the true. The mark of the beast is the counterfeit. For everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. The mark of the beast is the counterfeit for the seal of God. So let's talk about the seal, and then you can absolutely understand what the mark of the beast is. Who is it that seals the people of God? In other words, what is the sealing object? What is it that puts that seal on you? Ephesians 1.13, you were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is the one who seals the people of God. That's why in Revelation 7, where it talks about an angel with a seal in his hand with which to seal the people of God. That's a symbol for the Holy Spirit, my friends. At the end of time, God will seal people with his spirit. So my question for you this morning is, where can I find God's seal? Ezekiel 20, 12, moreover, I also gave them my what? My Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who does what? Who sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20, 20 says the exact same thing. God gave the Sabbath, that's the weekly Sabbath, to be a sign between us and him that he is the sanctifying creator. That's what the Sabbath was set up to be. That's why God blessed and sanctified the Sabbath. What does it mean to sanctify something? Make it holy. Someone said set it apart for a holy purpose. God sanctified marriage. Man was set aside for woman. Woman was set aside for man. God sanctified the Sabbath as well. It's more than just a day, my friends. It's a sign that he is the sanctifying creator. You say, well, I thought we were talking about seals. What's this sign business? In the Bible, the word sign, seal, and token are interchangeable. 
Notice Romans 4.11. This is speaking of Abraham. He received the sign of circumcision. And then what does it call it? A seal of the righteousness of the faith. Remember, my friends, Abraham was not saved by works. Abraham was saved by grace through faith. Just like everyone who ever lives and ever will live will be saved. Circumcision was the outward sign or seal in his life that he accepted the authority of God. Where can I go to find that seal specifically? Where would I find God's seal? Isaiah 8, 16, bind up the testimony, seal up the law among my disciples. Isaiah 8, 16 is telling us that in the law, is where you will find God's seal. Does that surprise you why the devil attacks the law of God so much? If you're the devil, would you want God's people to be sealed? I would do everything I could to fight it if I was the devil. Why do you think the devil attacks the law of God so much? So we've learned the Holy Spirit, the law, and also love are part of the seal. Remember John 14, 15? If you love me... Keep my commandments. If you love God, you are going to want to submit to God. You're going to want to submit to his authority. You want to keep his commandments. That's what the seal is about. What does the seal contain, my friends? Tell me, does anybody know what God's seal would contain? Three parts. His name, his title, his territory. By the way, When you look on TV, when the president is speaking, the presidential seal, you'll see the same parts. His name, Barack Obama, title, President of the United States, title, President, Territory, United States. God's seal contains the same three parts. His name, his title, and the territory that he governs. So we've learned the seal is in the law. Which commandment would it be in? The, someone said the fourth commandment. Exactly. It's going to be on the screen. Read it with me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Did you see the three parts? Part number one, I'll just review it with you. The Lord... Thy God, that's the name, made or creator. That's the reason we worship him. That's his title, his territory. Heaven, earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Are you a part of heaven, earth, the sea, and all that's in them? Uh, You are part of God's territory. The Sabbath, my friends, contains God's seal. Why do you suppose Satan attacks it so much? Why do you suppose Satan has tried to convince human beings that it was changed? You change the fourth commandment, you do away with the seal. And it's not enough to keep the Sabbath, my friends. It's an indication, an indication that you submit to God's authority. Why else would you keep the Sabbath? You're acknowledging Him as Creator. You're saying, God... Everything, I'm giving it to you. You rule my life. I don't rule it anymore. You rule it. And this is a sign or a seal of your authority. And it changes your life. Does not the Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath, uh, make you stand out? You can keep all the other nine commandments. You may not stand out. I certainly hope you keep the sixth one, especially when you're around me. But But the fourth commandment will make you stand out like a sore thumb, my friends. Notice this, the earth, heaven, and the sea and all that in them is. Does this point, does this sound like something in Revelation? 
Revelation is speaking of a time when there's going to be a crisis between two groups of people, those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. And in the first angel's message, I know we're studying the third, but the first angel's message contains a call to worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. It's pointing you directly to the fourth commandment. God is saying, Here, here's the call to worship me, because the Sabbath is my seal of authority. So we have the seal of God. What is the beast's mark of authority? We know what the mark of the beast, what the beast is. Who's the beast? The papacy. Okay, so what is the papal mark of authority? It is the sign of the Roman church's authority. Remember, my friends, the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast. Now, I see someone smiling out there because we have a tendency to say, well, I don't want the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast. Don't get the mark of the beast. No, remember, the mark of the beast, the mark or the mark of authority of the papal system of power So what is that? What is the mark of authority? What is it that that system claims? I'm not even going to speculate with you. I'm going to let the beast power speak for itself. Remember this statement? The Pope has the power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. That system is claiming the Pope himself can change divine law. What does the Bible call a statement like that? Blasphemy. Excuse me for just a moment. Thank you, Brent, for uh, leaving me this. Uh, Getting parched this morning. Okay, so it's saying we can change times, we can change law. What did Daniel 7.25 say this power would think to do? Change times and laws. Does that surprise you when they say the same thing? Here's another one. This is from an abridgment of Christian doctrine, page 58. Here's the question. How prove you that the church hath power to command feasts and holy days? Notice the answer. By the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants allow of, and therefore fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. They're saying, if you're keeping that day, you're following our authority. But Protestants will say, well, I I don't keep the other feasts. And so to the papal system, they're contradicting themselves. What it is that they claim is their ability to command feasts and holy days? The act of changing the Sabbath. Another statement, same book, same page. Have you any other way? Someone's saying, well, besides that, is there another way to prove that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Notice the answer. Had she not such power, she would not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day. A change for which there is how much authority? No, they're saying, and I respect that, at least the papal system will tell you, there's no scriptural authority for keeping Sunday. The Bible says Saturday. You want to keep that day, you're submitting to our authority. That's what the papal system is saying. I've met Protestants that have tried and tried and tried from this book to convince me that there's something in here that says that God changed the day. My friends, I will pay somebody $1,000 to prove it. I've been claiming that for years. Nobody's taken me up on it. There's nothing to prove that. A woman in the late 1800s was hearing about this, and she was concerned. She was a Catholic. She wrote the Catholic Church and asked, Do you claim the act of changing the Sabbath? Notice the response. Notice the wording. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is, what does it call it? A mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. What did the beast power just tell you its mark was? 
changing the day, Sunday observance. That's what it claims its mark is. Here's another statement uh, from the Catholic record, September 1st, 1923. Sunday is our mark of authority. And the reason they claim this, here, here's where it comes. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. They're saying Sunday is our mark of authority, and it proves to us that we're above this book. According to the beast power, that's its mark. I want to ask you again so we get it clearly. What is the mark of the beast? Sunday observance. Here is a blatant statement from the papal power. This was about 21 years ago from the St. Catherine Sentinel. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Not from any directions noted in the scriptures, but from what? The church's sense of its own power. Notice the next part, because this is very interesting. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. And you know, when I was, I had read this statement time and time again, and when I prepared it, um, something dawned on me when I was preparing this sermon. And that is some, the papacy recognizes the same thing we do, my friends, as God's end time movement. The papacy is, doesn't recognize any other Protestant group. What it's saying is, if you fo- keep Sunday, you're following us. The papacy is saying at the end of time, there's two great movements. There's God's end time movement proclaiming his Sabbath, and they name it. And then there's their movement And they're saying, we're above the Bible, we've changed this, and this is the reason why. This is our mark of authority. They're saying, if you want to follow Scripture, if you want to follow the dictates of your own conscience, you need to keep the true Sabbath day holy. If you want to follow church tradition, want to follow the papal system, keep Sunday. And that's what the issue lies at the end of time, my friends. So that brings up the question, does anyone have the mark of the beast now? After all, there's perhaps billions of people that keep Sunday holy. The question is, the answer to that question is no. Sunday observance will not become an enforceable mark until it's legislated in the future. The beast followers, my friends, who was it that sealed the people of God? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. The beast followers are marked by what the Bible calls, in Revelation, you see a second beast. Can you imagine John watching this first beast persecute God's people? And here comes the second beast that we're about to talk about. And um, he thinks, man, maybe God's people have a champion to fight for it. And sadly, that's not what prophecy states. The followers of God will be marked by the image of the beast. The Bible calls it the second beast of Revelation 13, the false prophet. I also call it the unholy spirit because it's the third member of the unholy trinity that's in contrast to God's holy trinity. The Holy Spirit seals God's people. The unholy spirit marks the followers of the beast for damnation. That's exactly what happens. Now, The mark of the beast is not something someone will force you to get. You're not going to be held down and somebody stamps some tattoo on your head or something else. It is a mark that people will choose. They will decide. And when the issues break, my friends, and they are soon to happen, people will decide. People will be polarized into one camp or the other. So who is this beast, second beast power? Revelation 13, 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spoke like a dragon. I'm going to do the same thing for you that we did last four weeks ago. I'm going to identify this beast and give you some characteristics that you can know beyond the shadow of a doubt who this beast power is. The first beast is the papacy and the Bible identifies the second beast as the United States of America. Does that surprise you? 
Clue number one. It would arise at the correct time. There's a time that this power arises. Revelation 13.10 is speaking about the wounding of the first beast. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. When did the first beast receive its deadly wound? Carolee said it a little while ago. 1798 A.D. The Bible is saying around this time, this second power arises. Does history testify? Did the United States arise sometime close to 1798? Let me give you a little uh, history lesson. 1776, the Declaration of Independence. 1783, we officially become a nation with the Treaty of Paris. From 1781 to 1789, we have the Articles of Confederation Government. In 1789, there's a constitutional convention in Philadelphia. My mom and I have stood in that building. It's an incredible place to be. Um, They have a constitutional convention, a new government under a constitution. And by 1791, all 13 states at that time ratify it. Um, Later on, the Bill of Rights comes into being. How close is that? Very close. Second clue, it would arise in the correct place. Where does the Bible say the second beast comes up out of? Remember, these are prophetic symbols. You're not going to see some seven-headed, ten-horned creature arise and then some two-horned beast. These are spiritual powers. Revelation 13, 11, I saw another beast coming out of what? Out of the earth. Where does the first beast come up out of? And the second beast comes up out of? Okay, so what does the sea represent? The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. It's a vastly populated area. My friends, Europe in 1776, close to 1798, there were millions of people. There were a lot of people in that area. This power arises in a different place. If the sea represents a vastly populated area, what does the earth represent? An unpopulated, or in this case, a sparsely populated area. So let me ask you this morning. Did the United States arise in a time close to 1798 A.D. in a sparsely populated area? Yes, absolutely. Question, uh, question, pardon me, clue number three. It would be a new nation. Then I saw another beast. Remember, the first beast was the continuation of the divisions of the Roman Empire. It was a continuation of the Roman Empire, and it overcame some of those divisions. It arose in Rome. Where did this second beast arise? In a different part of the world, in a new world. And notice another one, as the clue to its age in 1798, he had two horns like a lamb. Has anybody ever seen the horns of a lamb? They're little tiny nubs. You're not talking about a ram, a mature sheep. You're talking about a little lamb. They're tiny little nubs. This power is young. It's not part of Europe. It's a young power. Was the United States young at this time? Absolutely. Clue number four, it would rise up rapidly. Revelation 13, 11, I saw another beast coming up. Now, In English, sometimes we lose that translation. But in the original Greek, the word coming up literally means springing up rapidly. Or John literally sees this beast jump up out of the earth. Did America rise up rapidly? A hundred years after this prophecy, we defeat Spain in the Spanish-American War in less than four months. And the world is astonished. The United States comes on the scene as a superpower And the world is astonished. Clue number five, it would be a democracy. Notice back to the horns. He had two horns like a lamb. What is the horn? What does a horn represent in prophecy? Power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes when it's identified with crowns, it's kingly or imperial power. But this is different. And the text that tells us horn represents power is in Daniel 8, 7. Do you remember the battle 
depicted the ram and the, and the he-goat, the ram representing Medo-Persia, the, the he-goat representing Greece. Notice what it says about the he-goat. He was moved with anger against him, smote the ram, and broke his two horns. What happens when the horns are broke? Basically, and you can read it in history, Medo-Persia falls. There was no power in the ram to stand before him. That's the power. What is the power of the United States? What are these two horns? Kingly power? Two principles. Republicanism, a democracy, a government without a king, without a queen, without an empire, uh, an emperor, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. The president is an elected official. And the other one is Protestantism. Religion without a state church. Freedom of religion. Brothers and sisters, these are the principles that have guided the United States of America for almost 250 years. For almost 250 years. Clue number six, it would have worldwide influence. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. The first beast, the papacy, is a power with worldwide influence. The Bible predicted the rise of the United States as a superpower with worldwide influence. And my friends, what's interesting, 1,700 years before it happened, it was written in this book. The Reformers, Martin Luther, uh, John Huss, John Calvin, they will identify the first beast um, almost to the same. They identify it as the papacy. None of them had a clue who the second beast was. Do you know why? Why? It hadn't arisen in the days of Martin Luther. We, my friends, we know today who this second beast is. Is the United States a worldwide superpower? Does it have worldwide influence? And I wish I could end the prophecy there. I wish the prophecy stated, and America became great and was glorious and was a champion of God's freedom. But the prophecy does not end there. Clue number seven, it would change its character from a lamb to a dragon. We've already said who the dragon is. Who's the lamb? Christ. Revelation 13, 11, he spoke like a dragon. The U.S. goes from a lamb-like or Christ-like appearance to speaking like a dragon. And this really describes not only the government, but it will describe the religion. Protestantism changes from a religion founded on Christ, a Christ-like religion of freedom to a coercive, dragon-like religion becomes an apostate religion. So how does a nation speak? A nation speaks through its laws and its legislative bodies. So the Bible is predicting, and this goes in the future, one day soon. And my friends, it's about to happen. It is about to happen. The United States will pass laws that will require Sunday observance under penalty of economic embargo, sanctions, and eventually death. And then, when that law is passed, then Sunday observance becomes a receivable mark of authority. You see, God doesn't close the end of time before everyone knows the issues. When this law is passed, people are given a choice to decide. You have a small group filled with the Spirit of God preaching the truth, and you have the world that wanders after the beast. But there are many people in Babylon that we are to call out, my friends, and they don't know. Many of them are worshiping God according to the dictates of their own conscience. They don't know about the Sabbath, and that's why God is telling us we need to call them back to the Creator. This is the time. The Scripture says... It gets worse. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. One day, my friends, the United States and the other Protestant nations around the world following our example will unite church and state. Right now, what is one of the things we prize the most? A separation. That doesn't mean that godly principles do not need to be in government. That means that there should not be a church, a state church, to coerce and guide the government. 
In the days of Daniel, on the plain of Dora, you had an image set up. And what did the king tell them? Bow down and worship, or you're thrown in a fiery furnace. Daniel wasn't there that day, but his three friends were. And what did they do? They stood up. Were they thrown in the furnace? And God delivered them. Never forget, if you're thrown in the furnace of persecution, the same God is there. Daniel 6. Daniel himself, 70 years later, is tested. Thrown in the lion's den. God delivers Daniel. What's the issue in Revelation 13? A powerful union of church and state that tries to force God's people to worship contrary to, Daniel, to God's commandments just as in the days of Daniel. My friends, we need to be a Daniel today. We need to stand for Jesus. A few years ago, this would have been my question. We're living in a land of tolerance. How can this possibly happen? Well, let me share with you something. Are you aware of the, mass, the events occurring now, right now in the United States? A massive wave of immorality is sweeping the nation. People are being forced to accept immorality. The immorality, um, our own state, North Carolina, is heading a coalition of 11 others in a lawsuit against the United States because North Carolina is saying, you won't force that stuff on our people. We don't want that. You call it equality. We call it the coercive principles of Adolf Hitler. That's what we call it. And the most precious thing in our, that a person can have, my friends, is the ability to choose to think. And when people are opposed to that, people are being persecuted by this massive wave of immorality. People are being persecuted here in Georgia and other places. People who have, who have the religious backbone to stand for Jesus. My friends, if we're supporting movements like this that is, are coercing the people, don't be deceived. We will choose the wrong side when the crisis comes. If you're supporting movements that push immorality on people in the name of equality, you will choose the beast side. That's truth, my friends. The crowd is not going to heaven. The crowd's going the other place. We may even have family members that are supporting this move, these movements or living as part of them. Sometimes we wonder, how can we show we love them? but still stand for God. And my friends, the thing is, nobody loves a compromiser. The movement that says, oh, we love when Christian compromises, they look at Christians as disgusted. God says, I'll spew you out of my mouth if you you compromise. The best witness we can have for our loved ones and our family members, stand for God and his principles. Can you not see the future? The pendulum has swung from here to here. Can you not see people get disgusted with it and want to get back to God? Revelation 13 verses 14 and 15 tell us the devil will perpetrate this lie on people through spiritualism. There's nothing wrong with Christians wanting to get back to God, but we have to be careful under the spirit we do it. There's a movement, my friends, that has worked behind the scenes for almost 40 years to get these prophecies that we know to come to pass. Some Christians support the immorality. Some are saying, man, we got to take control of the government because we got to pass laws. They said that in Liberty Magazine in 1980. They were quoted. If Christians unite, we can do anything. We can pass any law or any amendment, and that's exactly what we intend to do. My friends, prophecy says that's exactly what will come to pass. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to return the country to a time of godly principles, but you must remember that the government could never coerce the Ten Commandments. You can never force anyone to keep God's law. Godly principles should be in government, but a church should never take control of the government. Prophecy predicts, my friends, and we will see it soon to happen. This movement working behind the scenes, it won't swing back to here. It'll swing the other way. And the United States will begin anew the persecutions of the Dark Ages. In the... 
the new world, the United States will form an image to the beast. This will happen. We can hide our heads in the sand and say it will never happen in my lifetime. Jesus said, in such a time as you think not, it will happen. My friends, let's not play like a spiritual ostrich and hide our heads in the sand. Now is the time. Now is the final warning. How can we give the final warning to people still in Babylon if we're not willing to submit to God? God is calling us to task. God is saying, I need a people, a people that will be holy, a people that will stand in the midst of these persecutions, a people that maybe some of them will lay down their lives, but God will win. The spirit of prophecy tells us that in spite of all that the enemy throws, the third angel's message will triumph gloriously. Now my call to you is, today is the decision. The decision as it was in the days of Joshua. The decision as it was in the days of Daniel. The decision as it was in the days of those during the dark ages that laid down their lives for the Lord. Today is the day to choose. Will this be your time? My friends, a people without the Lord can never stand against the beast, can never stand against a world united against God's people. But a people filled with the Holy Spirit will proclaim this message. Is this your desire? Is this your heart's call? Is the Holy Spirit knocking on the door of your heart? Today is the day. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My friends, there is a great coming crisis soon to break upon us. It's not popular to preach these things. It it almost sickens me to think about a nation Um, that God has blessed so much as ours that we'll go off the deep end and we'll persecute people faithful to the Lord. That's happening right now. But the sad thing is the Christians will do it. And we need to stand for Jesus. Remember, remember this. Those who follow Jesus will not be the losers in the conflict. Those who follow Jesus will be the winners. My appeal today... Do you want to say, I I choose to follow Jesus? I choose to follow the Lord. There might be things in my life that I've been holding back. But as for me and my house, as for me and my wife, as for me and my husband, my grandkids, my children, we will serve the Lord. No matter what the devil throws at us. If that's your desire, stand with me as we pray. Lord, you raised this great movement up over 170 years ago. And the reason we're still here is that we haven't fulfilled what you called us to do. You're asking for a people that when the times get tough, they stand for you. As did Job, as did Daniel, as did Daniel's three friends. Today, this is our desire, Lord. We don't know how soon the crisis will break. We know what prophecy says. We thank you for not leaving us in the dark. And Lord, maybe there are things in our lives where we, de- we uh, have held back. We know that we have to be victorious over all sin, and we can only do that through your power. But we know that you are all-powerful. So today we stand and say, no matter what, no matter when our government crumbles and immorality reigns and then the persecutions of the dark ages begin again, we will follow Jesus. Because when we follow Jesus, one day we will stand on the sea of glass with him. We thank you, Lord, for giving us this truth. Please help us. Please prepare us for the latter rain that is soon to fall, Lord is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our, uh, our closing song um, is I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Um, 
It comes from India. A man in the 1850s was asked to recant under death, under penalty of death. And that his words were, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And so that's what we're going to sing this morning. This is our closing, prayer, is our closing song. Gracious Heavenly Father, you've been so wonderful to us. You've given us guidance to know what's coming in the days ahead and the assurance that you'll be with us through all of it. Dear Lord, help us to commit our lives to follow you all the way in spite of anything that may deter us. Dear Lord, please help us to remain strong, to look to you and you only for guidance. Thank you for your love, dear Lord. Thank you for your warnings. And thank you for letting us know how to deal with the events to come. Dear Lord, please enter our lives. Please live in our hearts. And please guide us in all things. In thy name, amen. 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 Oh, and I forgot. Let us have a Lord... Also, we ask for a special prayer on the food we're about to partake of, that it will strengthen and nourish our bodies. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello, my name is David Cook. I'm the pastor here at the Pittsburgh Seventh-day Adventist Church. I just want to thank you for being with us today. And I want to invite you to come again sometime, whether you join us again online or whether you have stopped by for a personal visit. If you decide to do that, our address is 637 West Street, Pittsburgh, North Carolina. Of course, you may be far away, but that's okay. You can always contact us, whether you're far away or whether you're close. If you want to call me or text me, my texting and phone number is 336 
963-5012. If you'd like to email me, my email address is djcook28 at gmail.com. If you choose to text me, just make sure you leave your name in the text so that I know who you are. If you're interested in a Bible study or a personal pastoral visit, feel, feel free to contact me. I'd love to sit down and study whatever that topic is with you. Thanks again for joining us. Let me pray with you as we wrap up our time together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for providing a way for us to be together through this modern technology. And I also want to thank you for your Holy Spirit who connects our hearts together in a bond of love and for Jesus who died to make it all possible. I want to thank you that Jesus is coming again, that soon we can all worship together in person and not be separated by distance. I thank you so much that this will be happening very soon. We look forward to seeing Jesus in person. In his name, amen.